it's a real pleasure to join you online. I, I, I really wish I could have travelled to Madrid to take part in the conference in person, but of course that's not possible. Um, so um, let me let me just begin by um, introducing the paper um, that we're presenting here today. Um, this is a paper we've been working on um, during the past year. It's focused on um, the global adoption of um, corporate governance codes. Um, I hope it can give you um, a sense of um, how we see the um, current um, position. So now I'm just going to um, start sharing my um, presentation. Um, So I'm going to, I'm just going to check to begin with if you can see the slides. Yeah. So just to give a little bit of background and context um, to start with. So the adoption of the Cadbury Code in the UK in 1992 appeared at the time to be a response to specific local problems in financial reporting, audit and accountability that emerged towards the end of a decade marked by a boom in mergers and acquisitions, financial de deregulation, and a series of corporate governance scandals. In retrospect, however, it's clear that the Cadbury Code has exerted significant influence on corporate governance around the world, with many countries choosing to emulate the comply or explain approach that was pioneered by Cadbury. While the term corporate governance was virtually unknown to market practitioners and absent from most academic discourse in corporate law in the UK in the 1980s, it rose to prominence as supranational agencies, such as the OECD and the World Bank, recognised its significance for economic development and began to link corporate governance reform to economic development um, programmes. Against that general background, um, we aim to evaluate the extent to which the Cadbury model has been emulated around the world and to explain why it has proven to be amenable to adoption in countries where the legal system, corporate law and institutional investment frameworks are very different um, from the UK. So we look at we look at a substantial sample of countries, 43 in total, that includes um, the UK, all the countries in the EU and the G20 plus um, Nigeria. We focus on three potential explanations for the, um, for the global role of the UK model. And, and we'll come on to speak about those in more detail later. Um, and those are the three reasons that you can see um, at the bottom. Um, of the slide, competition and convergence, transplantation and adaptation, and markets as a source of normative experimentation. So firstly, let me say a little bit about the origins and rationale for um, comply or explain. We identify three main influences underpinning the development of the Cadbury Code in the UK. The first is flexibility in corporate governance, which has a long history in UK company law. The second is accountability in corporate governance, which is linked historically to the relatively broad discretion given to boards of directors by UK company law and the default articles of association. Now, Cadbury, interestingly, shifts um, the accountability focus from um, an ex-ante or shifts it to a more ex-ante approach from the more traditional ex-post approach, um, which we would see in the hard law um, system in the UK. The third influence is the tradition of self-regulation in UK corporate governance which is linked to the emergence of powerful collective organizations of shareholders that have historically demarcated a space for self-regulation, which at least prior to the spread of Comply or Explains codes around the world, 
was much less evident in other jurisdictions. So then let me expand a little bit by explaining the, in summary format, the evolution of Comply or Explain in the UK since those early days in the 1990s. Um, and we deal, we deal with three elements here. Um, one element of the flexibility um, associated with the Comply or Explain model um, is that it is amenable to more um, rapid revision than we po would be possible with statutory provisions. And we analyze that process um, by reference to, fault to several forms of evolution. And those, those three forms of evolution are those that are highlighted in the bullet points on the slide. With respect to the substantive provisions of the code, and we see there five key stages. Um, I'm not gonna go into these in detail, but these, these represent um, key development points in the substantive provisions of the code. So board structure and composition, for example, dealing with the role of non-executive directors, um, provisions on remuneration, um, diversity, which is a much later um, development, more than 20 years after the first code, and the, the very recent developments in the latest versions of the code that we have seen, which relate to the interests of stakeholders and the role of corporate culture in um, corporate governance. Um, the second focuses on the structure of the code. Um, so we move from a relatively simple code comprising just simple recommendations back in the original version to having a structure based around principles and provisions in the 1998 version. Um, and we then, we then also move to having um, different um, compliance obligations attached to those different parts. So we have the introduction of apply and explain and comply or explain. And then finally, we also observe that over time, um, there has been evolution in the self-regulatory space occupied by the code. So some elements of the code have migrated to um, hard law. Um, for example, um, provisions on remuneration um, have gone to say on pay in hard law. Um, while others have been absorbed by the code um, from hard law, so in particular provisions relating to um, strategic reporting, um, which uh, encompass the interests of um, stakeholders other than shareholders. So that... <coughs> <coughs> So, so then we can say a little bit about the operation of comply or explain in the UK. <clears throat> so we, we draw three conclusions from our studies. <coughs> First, um, the <coughs> compliance with the code is left to the discretion of the companies. <coughs> There is no common ground on how and when the comply or explain principle is satisfied. <coughs> <coughs> Some companies indicated that they did comply with the code, although in reality they did not. Second, in cases of non-compliance, explanations are often inaccurate with brief, generic, um, explanations offered based on boilerplate um, statements. Third, it seems as if the market has chosen compliance as the rule instead of viewing non-compliance with um, quality explanations also as compliance. The underlying premise of the comply or explain approach is precisely to allow for non-compliance if adequate reasons are provided um, 
but the but the explain option has increasingly been marginalised as a result of this um, what we might call boilerplate approach to um, explaining um, conformance and compliance with the code. So, in other words, what we what we observe over time is that the flexibility that was initially envisaged by the code as part of the UK model of corporate governance has not really developed in the practice surrounding um, the compliance with the code and the giving of explanations by um, companies that are um, subject to it. So I'm going to pass over now to my colleague, um, Professor Esser, to continue. Okay, if you can just um, assist with the slides, please, um, Ian. Thank you. So um, in this part, we um, present the empirical data in order to evaluate the extent to which the UK Corporate Governance Code represents a model that has been adopted by our um, sample of countries, as, as referred to before. While even a brief historical analysis of the adoption of comply or explain codes around the world would reveal clear links to the UK model, our aim is to explain why the UK model could improve, could so influ could prove so influential in jurisdictions where the legal and institutional frameworks are so different. Our focus is on the design, structure, and objectives of comply or explain regimes, and not their fine detail. So when looking at the UK as a global model, we focus on, we've conducted three studies, firstly, focusing on country characteristics. So focusing on the key features of um, institutional investment and um, corporate law. Secondly, we focus on initial conversions with code characteristics um, to see how far the codes are aligned with the Cap um, Capri code as introduced in the early 90s. Finally, we look at the code characteristics with regards to evolution and to see how far the codes have evolved um, in line with the UK model. So firstly, with regard to um, country characteristics, um, we look at how host countries differ from the UK with regards to, to various issues. The first bullet on the slide deals with share ownership um, pattern. So we focus first on the pattern of share ownership distinguishing between different levels of concentration. We observe that share ownership in most of the host countries is strongly concentrated. So just on the next slide, you will see um, in um, column two. So um, next slide, thank you. And um, you will see on column two, the share ownership pattern with MC indicating moderate concentration and SC strongly concentrated. So as I said, we observe that share ownership in most of the host countries is strongly concentrated with fewer examples of moderate concentration and only one example of dispersed ownership. Now, this slide only deals, of course, with a sample of 12 countries. We did consider um, 43 countries. So back to the previous slide, I can focus on our uh, second vocal point. The, the second vocal point um, is the degree of foreign and institutional ownership, respectively. Both are linked to the role of, um, of globalization in financial markets as a driver of the adoption of comply or explain codes. So on the next slide, again, the third column, um, you will see um, some figures with regards to the percentage of foreign ownership. And the general picture here is of significant and growing levels of foreign and institutional ownership. So just back to the previous slide, our third characteristic is based on categorizing countries according to whether their system of corporate law prioritizes the interests and powers of shareholders or the board of directors. And this provides an indication of whether a code might uh, present um, or represent a mechanism to improve board accountability as per Capri in the UK and um, empower shareholders. The, the last um, aspect that or factor that I would like to focus on is the, the fourth characteristic um, where we focus on the extent to which the system of corporate law in the host country protects shareholders. So we adopt this as a proxy for the potential for a complier explain code to enhance shareholder protection and thereby to strengthen local capital markets. The results demonstrate considerable diversions in shareholder protection 
prior to the introduction of the relevant national codes, even within the EU, where the harmonization of company law was already quite advanced prior to the adoption of codes. So that slide, as I said, um, indicated um, those data. To turn now then to, to the second set of data, and that deals with the code characteristics at giving you a bit of an overview. Now, we mentioned before that we surveyed a total of 43 corporate governance codes in 43 countries, and we collected data on the custodian of the code, its legal status, the scope of application, the structure of the code, in other words, whether it's tiered or unitary, and the form of disclosure required. We looked at the EU27, um, the G20, and also included um, Nigeria. First, with regards to the custodian of the code, um, the, the data here indicates that the primary self-regulatory origins of the UK code have been diluted over time as public bodies or regulated exchanges have taken uh, um, on a more significant role um, in, in host countries, as indicated on the custodian of code pie chart. With regard to the structure of the code, um, the majority of codes are unitary, with only five following a tiered approach, including um, the UK. This is actually one aspect where most of the codes are not in line with, with the UK position. On the current legal status of the code, um, a code can either have no legal basis or be subject to um, mandatory disclosure or mandatory compliance. Mandatory compliance for us goes beyond disclosure and requires substantive compliance with the relevant provisions. Mandatory disclosure is the favorite technique in the majority of instances. In terms of scope, the majority of codes apply to listed companies only, with the exception of Portugal and South Africa applying to any corporate form and Nigeria stating that it applies to all issuers of equity and securities. So the majority um, of codes follow a comply or explain approach, with the exception of the, the Hungarian code, which follows a comply or explain and non-disclosure approach. The South African and Nigerian codes following an apply and explain approach, Brasilia following an apply or explain approach, China non-disclosure, and the Australian code, the if not, why not approach. approach. So it is clear from this data that the majority of codes are thus in line with, with the UK um, code, except with regards to the structure of the code, where, where the majority follows a unitary rather than a tiered approach. So the, the final set of data to, to focus on then it deals with um, code characteristics and conversions. So firstly, we looked at initial conversions, looking at a, a sample um, or while comparing the sample to, to the position as per the, the Capri report and the 1992 version. And here we looked at um, provisions regarding or recommendations regarding broad composition, directors remuneration, and, and finally reporting audit and risk control. With regards to evolution, we compared our sample to three key stages in evolution in the UK Corporate Governance Code. We firstly considered diversity, and, and here we used the 2014 version of the code. For stakeholder interest and corporate culture, the, the, the two other issues that we considered, we looked at the current um, 2018 code. So we focus on functional conversions. So providing a, using a score system, providing a, a score of two if the provisions of the, the relevant code are at a minimum functionally equivalent to the relevant UK provisions, one if there are there is any other provision, and otherwise a, a score of zero um, has been awarded. So on the next slide, you will be able to, to see the, the, the scores um, according to the number of countries and, and just briefly explain that, that slide. So we said that we looked at 43 countries. So if you look at the, the first um, column saying conversion score initial, it's very high. So most of the, the, the countries and all the codes looked at are actually in line with the, the initial conversions. In other words, in line with the, the 1992 um, Capri report with 41 of those codes um, or countries scoring the maximum of six points. Evolution, it is more spread out, of course, and um, if you look at the, the table at the bottom, you will see that most of the countries did score the maximum of two with regards to stakeholders, 
following diversity and culture. So as I said, building on this data on the model code, we looked at the same set of codes in countries, but with reference to how corporate governance codes evolved. In this instance, we code initial conversions with the UK category code, so that's listed in the conversion score initial um, column, and subsequent conversions as the code evolved in the UK. Thank you. And um, at that point, I would like to, to hand over to Ian again. Thank you. So um, now, now I'm going to move on to come on to the more um, discursive or analytical um, part of our paper where we, we, we attempt to stand the data and provide explanations for the um, the, the spread of the UK model um, around the world. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, um, there were three potential reasons that we identified why the UK code has been um, so influential for the development of um, soft law governance codes around the world. And those are um, the competition and convergence, transplantation and adaptation and markets um, as a source of normative experimentation. So I'm going to I'm going to expand out those um, those reasons in, in a little bit more um, detail now. So the the claim that global convergence in corporate and securities law has been driven by a process of competition is most clearly linked to influential scholarship that emerged around the turn of the millennium. At the level of corporate law, competition is made possible to the extent that the law facilitates choice in the jurisdiction of incorporation, while competition in securities law is driven mainly by the relevant conditions for foreign listing. The competition claim was linked to the capacity of national systems of corporate governance to deliver effective corporate governance, viewed primarily from the perspective of shareholders. And support for the potential benefits of competition was linked to the beneficial effect, especially within the US system, um, of competition between state systems of corporate law. Turning to the, the, the second aspect, transplantation, the process of transplantation and adaptation has attracted much interest in recent years as an explanation of the process of legal change associated with globalization and legal development, especially in transition economies. While there remain doubts as to the extent to which effective transplantation can occur, largely as a result of the different contexts in which the same rules may be applied. There can be little doubt that transplantation and adaptation have been significant factors in the spread of corporate law rules and techniques in recent times. And then on the, on the third aspect, um, markets and normative experimentation, the idea of markets and private law as the legal foundation of markets, as a source of normative experimentation, can be traced back um, to Hayek, who viewed private law and markets as having the capacity to solve problems of resolve resource allocation and related issues of organizational structure more efficiently than central state control. Another strand of this um, concept can be linked to the role of experimentalism as a technique for developing regulatory regimes, in contrast with the earlier uh, regulatory trend of um, command and control. And now I, I will deal with um, each of these issues um, in a little bit more detail by reference to um, the data in our study. <clears throat> so, I think firstly, with regard to <coughs> competition and convergence, we find um, 
limited evidence of this paradigm as a driver of international convergence um, in corporate law. So that's corporate law as opposed to codes, which we would categorize as um, soft law. <clears throat> So convergence is more evident um, in respect of codes, both initially and in terms of their evolution. <coughs> but um, importantly, um, the evidence that we find for competition as the driver is indirect and contextual. And it's based on particularly the observation that Host countries often reference competition in their rationale for adoption. And the fact that um, code adoption, and we would see this particularly in the 1990s and the early 2000 years, that code adoption coincides with um, structural changes in stock exchanges worldwide um, to a profit model. And of course, the profit model generated um, competition between um, stock exchanges, and one element of that competition was the um, quality of their provisions relating to um, corporate governance. And that, of course, ultimately drove the linkage between um, governance codes and stock exchange listing rules. So moving to the... Um, the second factor, transplantation and adaptation. While our evidence of convergence is in principle indicative of transplantation of a UK style comply or explain code across many countries, that perspective does not focus sufficiently on the process of transplantation as an element re relevant for its success. Central to the process are the conditions under which the transplant is received in the host country and the manner in which the local institutions interpret and enforce the relevant rules. A key feature of the spread of comply or explain codes has been the capacity of such codes to be adopted without adjustment to national corporate law and to be enforced by market discipline, largely without reference to national systems of enforcement um, or adjudication. So in that sense, what we see is transplantation of a self-contained system of hard law, of soft law, which is separate from the national systems of hard law. <laughs> And then finally, um, focusing on the third element of our um, rationalization of the spread of codes from the UK, um, the, the global spread of comply or explain codes can also, we believe, be explained by reference to the role of markets as a source of normative experimentation. And this refers both to innovation in norms so, for example, comply or explain as a new form of soft law, which emerged from the Cadbury Code in the UK. But also importantly, experimentation as a technique for developing such norms. Um, and there are some key features of the experimentation process that I would um, identify as um, being linked with the comply or explain um, technique as it developed in the UK. So the idea that, um, and, and here I'm focusing on the, 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 the first heading um, under experimentalism. So presumptive rules would be used um, more than mandatory rules. In other words, rules which could be um, rules which could be complied with or could be um, explained if they were not complied with. In other words, a, a form of default rule rather than a mandatory rule. The importance of reporting and disclosure as an element of the regulatory framework. Um, 
and um, the role of monitoring of the um, compliance associated with the framework. And then finally, and importantly, learning and adaptation as the system develops. And we can see that, I think, in the evolution of the UK system that I outlined earlier, that learning and adaptation have been um, important um, elements. Now, our, our research suggests that these factors um, that I've identified were more prominent in the development stage in the UK as the source of the code than they were elsewhere, where we believe that convergence and transplantation are more credible explanations for adopting the comply or explain code. Um, and you know, one, one reason for that would be that I think in terms of the country characteristics that we identified, those are generally very different across the types of countries that we um, examined. And our, our sense was that many of those countries would not be amenable to the this kind of normative experimentation um, that we find more strongly um, in the UK. So to, to, to round up on our um, presentation and um, research project, we could conclude that what we observe is substantial convergence in codes, both in terms of the initial formulation and in their evolution across diverse legal and financial systems around the world. Innovation is evident in terms of rule type, rule content, rule content and enforcement. Um, avoiding overlap with local legal systems. The linkage to hard law is generally only through disclosure, preserving the character of codes as a system with little or no substantive migration to hard law. And this process represents overall the carve out of a significant self-regulatory space in which a de facto transnational code of corporate governance has been created and operated um, by market actors. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm gonna pass now back over to the chair